गुड इवनिंग रमेश सर Good evening. Good evening, uh, sir. I go. How are you? Uh, I'm good, sir. Thank you. Great. I was just searching for you. Whether you are joining us? I think it just got signed as my son's name, so it's changed it. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, that's why. That's why I was searching your name and I was unable to find that. So, so how are things there, sir? In uh, uh, Dehradun? Mm -hmm. I'm not in Dehradun. I'm in Coimbatore. Oh, okay, okay. So you're in my neighborhood only. <laughs> Exactly. That's what somebody said. I could simply would have gone to Palakkad. Uh, yes. <laughs> It's not very far. Mm, right. So, so I'm maybe maybe maybe, uh, maybe maybe when uh, we have the offline sessions and all, um, uh, you will be able to come and Hopefully. speak at our department. Because Hopefully, right, so, when uh, things open up, let's see if it opens yes. up. All right. Hopefully, it will open up shortly. <laughs> so, I hope so. Sir, uh, can you check whether you are able to share your uh, presentation? I think so. I think I did check. It's possible. Right. Huh? So maybe if you can put the first slide, then it will be okay. Uh, so just just check that, sir, because uh, then I can ask uh, one of my students to start the session. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, it's coming. Right. Mm -hmm. So shall we start, sir? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, already live on uh, FB, so mm -hmm. uh, I think I have shared the link also. Uh, maybe um, uh, you can share it with your friends and also that they can also see it on live. Right. Sure. Later. All right. So uh, uh, Aishwarya, can we start? Yes, sir. Okay. Please go ahead. Good evening to all, and welcome to Emerging Discourses in Geography webinar series. This is the eighth webinar in the series on the science of scale and space, integrating geography and ecology. As COVID-19 has completely curtailed the offline classes, this is an initiative of Department of Geography at Government College Chittoor, Palakkad, Kerala, to create research awareness among students through webinar series. One of the best way to expose them to interdisciplinary research and also to guide them for their higher studies and career opportunities. The webinar is organized on all Saturdays, 5 to 7 p.m., with participants joining on Zoom platform and Facebook Live. The participants include UG, PG programs in geography, research scholars, faculty members, and professionals from across India. I would like to take this opportunity to welcome the resource person for today's webinar, Dr. Ramesh Krishnamurthy, scientist, Wildlife Institute of India. I also take this opportunity to welcome all the faculty members and students of Department of Geography, Government College Chittur, and other geography departments in Kerala. I also welcome faculty members, professionals, research scholars, students, and faculty who have joined from various parts of India. I once again welcome each and everyone to this webinar. Let me now invite my friend, Ms. Krishna Prida, to introduce the today's resource person to you. Thank you. Good evening to all. We have an expert resource person today, Dr. Ramesh Krishnamurthy. Dr. Ramesh Krishnamurthy is the scientist of Wildlife Institute of India, Daradun, and adjunct professor of faculty forestry, University of British Columbia, Vancouver, Canada. He is graduated in BSc Zoology and have a master's degree in wildlife biology from ABC College, Bharatidasan University, Tamil Nadu, and received a gold medal in both courses. He secured PhD degree in forest ecology and environment from Wildlife Institute of India. In addition to gold medal, he also received a prestigious Distinguished Foreign Scholar Award by the U.S. Regional Association of the International Association for Landscape Ecology and NASA MSU Professional Enhancement Award by National Aeronautics and Space Administration and Michigan State University, USA. He is also continued to provide research and conservation inputs on various, various aspects continues. He specializes in landscape ecology, species recovery strategies, and integration of technology in wildlife research and management. 
He serves in various commissions of IUCN and Economic and uh, uh, Conservation Associations. He joined as researcher in 1995 and worked in various capacities and in 2008 joined as faculty member in the Department of Landscape Level, Level Planning and Management. He is also the Associate Nodal Officer of Remote Sensing and GIS Laboratory and Nodal Officer of the recently established State of Art Landscape Ecology and Visualization Laboratory at the Wildlife Institute of India under the Climate Change Adaptation and Mitigation Program. His professional, his professional interests include landscape ecology, conservation of mammals and birds, landscape dynamic modeling including climate and anthropogenic effects, conflict resolution mechanisms, conservation breeding and reintroduction, integration of advanced technologies in wildlife research and management, such as GPS, satellite telemetry, wireless sensor applications, and unmanned aircraft. His key professional and personal goals is creating new generation of leaders and professionals with a rational approach for integrated landscape management strategies towards sustainable conservation of natural resources and human well-being. He has been supporting young students, researchers, and supervised several master's dissertations and PhD theses, including from foreign universities on diverse topics and other landscape across India and regional countries. His knowledge and expertise have also resulted in around 60 research publications, including in high impact factor channels and 70 presentations in national and international conferences. So we can sum up that we are getting an esteemed and honorable guest in front of us. So let me call upon Dr. Ramesh Krishnamurti, sir, to start the session. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh... Uh, for this uh, elaborate introduction, I would say, and thank you to Mr. Uh, Dr. Govindam Kuti for, uh, I mean, organizing this uh, webinar. So, although I'm not very regular on the webinar, but I, I see this is uh, a kind of a effort to sensitize people and, uh, you know, kind of encourage them in getting into different uh, discipline of uh, the multidisciplinary activity. So I think without taking much time, I'll uh, go straight away into the presentation so that it's much easier for others to kind of uh, see the details and appreciate it. Thank you. I hope uh, the presentation is visible. Yes, sir, yes, sir. it's visible. Yeah. Okay, so I think uh, when, um, this email or telephone came from uh, Mr. Gondal Kuti. I was just thinking that, you know, so this could be one subject area where I could uh, kind of uh, take up and sensitize people because we've been discussing this uh, both national and international uh, events and even uh, some of the subjects. But uh, as I feel, uh, this particular subject is not taken root in many of these institutions across the country. So therefore, I thought, you know, just to highlight this particular science. So, I put this topic, this, the science of scale and space, is essentially to highlight uh, one major subject called uh, landscape ecology. So it is kind of a multidisciplinary uh, subject area. Uh, there's been a lot of developments in the science uh, over a period of time, so tools, you know, techniques, uh, theoretical developments, everything's happened. And in fact, uh, this particular science guides uh, several management decisions uh, particularly the, the large landscape, climate change, those kind of things. But but in India, I think we have a long way to go. So maybe just to talking about a little bit what it is and how it can be applied and uh, what are the scopes that is existing for uh, young students, even professionals, so we could discuss. So uh, if anybody has any question in between, um, you are welcome to ask or we can save the questions at the end so we can discuss whichever way um, I think the coordinator feels. Uh, I'm okay with it. So we'll have questions at the end, sir. Okay, so no problem. So the science of scale and space is, is what I wanted to talk is the science of landscape ecology. So landscape ecology is essentially the study of relationship between spatial pattern and ecological process that is the causes and effects of landscape change at varying scales from centimeters to hundreds of kilometers. This is a typical definition of landscape ecology. What it 
exactly says you can take it uh, now kind of a two take home from this particular statement is that it is about spatial pattern and process so what you see now whatever i mean it is not just about uh, the natural world even the social world even among us so landscape ecology makes us understand based on the pattern for example you sitting across in a classroom or you see a uh, paddy field or you see any bird groups so everything is not random there is certain pattern so if you are if you are in a same class you tend to sit you no know, close to your friend or send, tend to sit in a very comfortable uh, chair or something like that so it becomes a pattern but then the pattern has some reason so the reason which is guided by what exactly it's like i said oh it's a comfortable place to sit or i'm sitting with my friend so when you have that kind of pattern then that kind of gets into the process okay when you're sitting together then you have more interaction more exchanges and things like that so that is exactly what happens in the natural world so what you see is structure that is a pattern and the pattern is guided by the processes and the pattern itself it guides the process it's a kind of interrelationship so that's one take home that i wanted to highlight second is the landscape uh, the kind of ecology it looks at different scales the scales can vary from centimeter to hundreds of kilometer depending on what is the focus of our understanding if i am a no mammalogist or if i am looking at large mammals so then my scale of uh, focus will be much higher as compared to if i am looking at and or amphibians which will where the scale of focus will be much lower so please remember this sorry adha na edukalam maybe uh, you can mute uh, this the host can mute others maybe helpful so that's where this topic is kind of uh, put like scale and space because spatial pattern uh, will decide what it is and how things are happening the scale we decide you know the focal area so again depending on your question or your management objective so landscape ecology if you look into the details it actually combines the spatial approach of geography so in fact i used to put it like landscape architecture so how the landscape is arranged so the geography is in a way is allows us to see how the the pattern is there across space so what kind of soil structure what, what kind of diversity exists i think the geography allows us with the functional approach of the ecologist okay so the way the ecologist approach okay so it's it's, it's combines these two okay so in, in fact it's a combination of geography and ecology i would say that's where and the topic itself it says integrating and geography and ecology so in this particular talk we are not saying that we are trying to integrate it we are trying only highlighting this has an integrated component itself so landscape ecology these uh, has some of these basic elements we call it grain extent core edge corridor matrix i'll explain what what these are so when you say grain grain is a smallest unit of uh, any our observation so if you are having a remote sensing image or if you having any picture like you have a photograph so the photograph is the viewing area so if you take this example so this is a landscape it's a extent you have like you have a forest you have a grassland you have a mountain you have a wetland it's a comp it's a combination so composition is there so you can see this pattern how this pattern is arranged the grain is the smallest unit suppose if we just to divide this into a multiple smaller 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 unit the smaller unit that you can recognize so if we can just correspond this into a photograph or aerial photograph or satellite data so the pixel the, the pixel size is a grain so the 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 minimum information is stored in the pixel so when you combine all the pixels together then makes up a photograph so in landscape so these two are important grain which is the smallest unit the extent is a maximum area that you're focusing on okay for a large mammal you probably would have larger grain larger extent 
but smaller organism you might have smaller grain small extent sometimes you have smaller grain a larger extent it's possible core is when you look at the whole system which is the central part of the area which which is kind of surrounded by uh, many uh, land uses so the core is a i mean that's probably easier for everyone to understand what exactly core is a central part edge is what actually is you know is in the periphery of the area because all these have important uh, functions in a system because if a core area is large then whatever the population exists there one can ensure they may remain viable if the core area is smaller it becomes a fragment then you have different issues similarly if you have smaller edges or if you have exposed large edges so influence of neighbor will also vary corridor is again known to many of you corridor is a place corridor is a kind of a connecting link between two different areas where which basically facilitates animal movement so that's what is corridor matrix is something is a, a one word which captures the whole system that you have for example when i say it's an agriculture matrix or if i say it's a grassland matrix or forest matrix so matrix is a dominant element in a system in a landscape so if somebody says it's a grassland matrix you can automatically assume this is a area which has got whatever the grain is whatever the extent is but dominated by a grassland so there could be other elements also like you have forest mountain but then most dominant factor is a matrix so all this can be quantified you know through processes there are many options available in landscape ecology but conventionally when you try to understand the landscape through matrix you know what is a general energy flow in this area if it is an agricultural matrix you can understand what kind of biodiversity you can expect if it is a forest matrix what you can expect so it really gives us an initial idea to start with so when we talk even talk about landscape ecology landscape ecology but i think it's also important to understand what landscape is right so here the landscape is is a is a kind of definition comes with different people what you actually see from an ecological perspective a landscape is a mosaic of interacting ecosystem at any scale so i said earlier on talked about centimeter to hundreds of kilometer so you decide so it's a mosaic of interacting ecosystem because it is not just one area it is not just a grassland it's not just a forest area it's a mosaic habitat it's it's a kind of diverse mosaic habitat but then it looks same when you see from far and that particular composition should be unique so that is an interacting ecosystem at any scale an area spatially heterogeneous in at least one factor of interest so when you say one factor of interest you see okay this is a forest matrix but then you have other composition also the heterogeneity is there from a wildlife perspective the landscape is a heterogeneous distribution of habitat okay that's why the biologists would like to see in an area which is a multiple habitat exists so patches a gradients it could be anything so it's a landscape is a heterogeneous distribution of habitat but we can also kind of uh, look at this from different perspective um taking into uh, the land centric and species centric concept uh, as we already discussed the element in landscape is repeated over and over so when you see it so the same kind of composition you can see them across large area then when you when you fly over when you take aerial photograph or when you just traveling together you are able to see this heterogeneous area but they occur over large period that's why if you go to a coastal and marine system there the composition is there but then you see them a large extent so that's that becomes the landscape if you go to western ghats so they have the composition is different but then they form a large extent so that's what the pattern is repeat over over and over so to see a, a kind of mosaic area of it's the same it's, it's just a visual appearance of how this landscape looks like so in terms of the landscape definition one can easily go with the land centric where you consider large area which is the extent containing single or several systems for example it could be water bodies it could be so when i say single system i'm not talking about you uh, know homogeneity i'm talking about heterogeneous environment 
it could be just grassland. Grassland itself has a multiple pattern. There's a tall grass and the short grassland. There is open area. There's a scattered trees. Okay, or several systems. So it could be a large area where the forest is there, the grassland is there. No, then within the forest, different types exist. So sometimes human habitation is there. So it could put together. It could be land land centric definition. So you can define a landscape through a land centric area. Other one is from the species perspective. So it's suppose I'm interested in landscape ecology of tiger or elephant or amphibian. The extent depends on the species. Suppose if a tiger requires a large area, its extent is larger. My landscape boundary is decided based on the, the species boundary. So in, in which case it can include several systems. It could be the river system, it could be corridor, core, whatever. So this is how you start looking at it. So here is a picture. You can look at a different system. So as we discussed earlier on, a landscape is not necessarily defined by its size because we already said it could be from centimeter to hundreds of kilometers. So you only define based on the context, based on what you have there. Okay. It's, so as you see here, it is defined by a spatially heterogeneous area relevant to the phenomena under consideration. What exactly you are interested in? So I want to look at landscape. What landscape you want to look at it and why you want to look at it? You need to see that. So I'm looking at the landscape for bird, butterfly, mammal, or social influence. It could be anything. So your landscape boundary will be defined, you know, defined by the the phenomena under consideration. Because as people say, it's all in the eyes of the beholder. So what you actually see is what will decide because your focal area will give you the kind of result that you want. If you don't have that clear definition with respect to your objective, you will run into a lot of problems because you may not be able to get a clear pattern. You may not be able to understand the landscape issues clearly. So defining landscape, there are challenges because it's not as easy as I simply said, because you will want to say, sir, how do I then make this boundary? What, what, what is it, my concept? Because I know I'm going to study elephant, but then how do I decide my boundary? So there are options. So you need to really see Conceptual model of landscape structure. You need to choose what kind of conceptual model exists. So there are thematic content. I'll explain it what it is. So thematic content and resolution and selecting the spatial case, scale, which is what I mentioned earlier, grain and extent. Dealing with fragmenting features. For example, it could be linear fragmentation. It could be something else. And considering the landscape beyond and context because sometimes landscape boundary is not as hard as one can visualize, but might be much more fluid. And the context might be very difficult to fix. So there are challenges, but it's not that people can have not been able to do it. It's all been done. So things are there. So, and the other one is um, scale and context matter. Why? Why do scale and context matter when it comes to the you know, landscape, defining the landscape? So if you see the statement, it says, as one changes scale, systems may switch between closed and open. So don't get confused. Um, so if it's, it's like saying your focal area, for example, you go to a place, you go to, you go to some um, ocean, you have many islands, okay? There are many islands. So if you are interested in studying the pattern there, each island, is a closed system because nothing is possible to go because land is locked, surrounded by the water. So for you, it might look like a closed system. If you are going to study a mammal which cannot swim, then it is a closed system. But if you are going to study bird species, for example, suddenly the closed system become open system because the birds can fly from one island to other island. Okay, depending on what your objective is, one, we can change the scale. The moment you change the scale, 
the system which you just now mentioned as a closed system can actually become a open system okay so this is also applicable in a terrestrial system the forest area is fragmented but the fragmentation is not permanent for a species because what is fragmented for an amphibian may not be fragmented for a large mammal what is fragmented for a large mammal may not be fragmented for birds so depending on focus of a study the system dynamics also changes and similarly when you try to do a relationship the statistical relationship also changes depending on the scale so here is an example i can also give you another example on prey predator relationship so let's say this is a fly catcher this is a red start okay or the same you can also apply the same concept into predator and prey so generally predator and prey will have a positive relationship as prey number increases you will have increase in predator number so that is a general concept so now when you go out in the forest when you study them you start laying a plot you lay a plot of 1 km okay then when you start making a statistical relationship you tend to see a positive relationship as you see here in this regional scale okay ഇതായി കട്ടായി കണക്ഷൻ കട്ടായി Sir, I think it got disconnected. Oh, I got disconnected. I think uh, I was just about talking about this, uh, the prey-predator relationship. So, yep. as you said, when the predator number... So, your pre presentation. Also gone, huh? Yes, sir. Yeah. Is it okay now? Yes, sir. It's okay. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So basically, the predator-prey relationship statistically might become positive or negative depending on what scale you are measuring. If you are measuring slightly larger scale, then you you have prey also exist, predator also exist. So you'll get a positive trend like what you have in a regional scale. But if you are measuring in a smaller scale. your relationship can actually become negative so it's very important for us to decide on the appropriate scale if you really want to understand the ecological phenomena if you go just blindly to the field and try and start quantifying things the relation the statistical relationship you might even get a correlation value very high but it makes no sense so you can some this is some of the thing that uh, we generally uh, get into uh, when you do statistical analysis unless you look at appropriate scale what the kind of relationship that you have may not have biological meaning so this is a classic example here so obviously one would expect predator and prey to have positive relationship but you can actually get a negative relationship if you have much finer scale measurement so essentially it is up to us up to the investigator up to the manager to define the landscape appropriate the phenomena to concentration because as i said any interpretation of pattern and process is ultimately constrained by the landscape definition so if you don't have a clarity on this our pattern and process understanding will be biased or may not be complete so just to reiterate landscape ecology focus 
on spatial heterogeneity and pattern, it allows us to really understand a landscape as to how to characterize it. How do we characterize the whole landscape? And then what do you have? How, where did it come from? What kind of phenomena existed on a temporal or spatial scale? So where it came comes from? How it changes over time? So with the kind of characteristic features that you have, how does it change over time? Okay, it changes. Why it matters to us? Why should we concern? Where it affects? So why it matters means where it causes impact, which is important to ecology or conservation. Then how can we manage as a manager? So I think the landscape ecology allows us these, which are very important for day-to-day life or long-term conservation of nature and natural resources, including social science. So the landscape ecology as a science has a certain history. Okay, maybe when anybody picks up a textbook, they will know you see this term landscape is defined in 1931, it's way back. But landscape ecology as a science did not emerge that late. It is only around 1980s. So, but then it has a long history, but the far past, the emphasis has been on the typology. So what exactly the location and classification and nomenclature. So mostly this landscape ecology has two school. There's one European school, other one is American school. So the concept which are used in America and US, I mean, um, US and Europe are slightly different. So, but then things have changed over a period of time. So like European concept is mostly looking at the human centric, looking at the build up areas, land, architecture, planning, design. Whereas in American school, it's more looking at natural system, uh, looking at the pattern process uh, for a conservation perspective. So you can see this, but that's why the landscape architecture and all is much more developed in uh, Europe and other uh, modified system. Whereas places like America, India, we still have not modified so much of it as compared to the other system. So, but then for a landscape, <laughs> so why is it important to land managers? Because effective solution to the extinction crisis require landscape approach. So people have realized it, whether conservation of elephant or a tiger, we need to have landscape approach. Today, when India has developed a landscape, you know, kind of a national wildlife action plan, landscape approach is mentioned as one of the important chapter to guide conservation of the country. So because these species are large, wide ranging species, you cannot have a design or conservation actions at a very small place. So these are some of the examples for landscape dependent species, Asian elephant, tiger, even the birds, people, these are our iconic species. The two of them are, of course, our national animals, national animal, national mammal, national um, bird, and um, elephant is our flagship species. But all these have much larger area than its a counterpart. So they are actually called as a landscape dependent species. Our strategy has to be on the landscape scale. So just moving forward, some of this you know, conservation model that exists with taking landscape ecology as a background science. Um, so one is the land centric core buffer concept. So biosphere reserve. So Neil Gri biosphere reserves, you must have heard. It includes uh, parts of Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, Kerala. So you, you are actually very much part of this uh, buff, uh, biosphere reserve. So that, the model, the biosphere model basically seek to integrate three main functions. Conservation of biodiversity, okay, and cultural diversity, economic development that is socio-culturally and abnormally sustainable, logistic support for research, monitoring, and normal education training. Okay. So if you look at the, the biosphere concept, it has got core area for conservation, monitoring, and non-destructive research. That's the you see it in this red core zone. So that's a core area. Then you have buffer zone surrounding or adjoining the core areas. This is for activities compatible with sound ecology practices, which also includes some extraction, people interact in this buffer zone. 
Then you have transition areas for activities where stakeholders work together, sustainable to manage the area resources. Here, this is more human dominated. So this is typically a landscape approach, uh, which was thought of from Biosphere Reserve concept. Unfortunately, the science of landscape ecology, but the, the need for conservation action had some mismatch of scale. People really wanted to have a conservation goal, but not yet scientifically supported by the science. No? So landscape ecology, when it evolved, now in the recent past, I would say, all these things have kind of synergized. So they have met, there's a synergy have been formed. So people are able to exploit the available science for guiding this conservation. So now people are talking about biodiversity bio bio reserve from the spatial pattern and looking at the core buffer concept, corridor, everything, yeah. So other one is about the project tiger. Okay, project tiger is an, again a landscape contest. Now this approach transformed into landscape conservation plan. So tiger conservation plan is focused in each of the tiger reserve and it includes elements of landscape ecology. So originally the project tiger, the objective is to ensure a viable population tiger in India for scientific, economic, aesthetic, and cultural and ecological values and to preserve for all time areas of biological importance as a natural heritage for, for the benefit, education, and enjoyment of the people. This is what written in the original document of Project Tiger. But things have changed. So the interaction have been understood. Animal dispersal have become a common. So what earlier used to be a management plan now become a landscape plan. So the Project Tiger scheme also supports wildlife management, protection measure, and site-specific development to reduce dependence of local communities and tiger resources. So it's all as a linked component coming into a focus as to how the landscape approach is important for management. So that is why as a student, as a faculty, I think this understanding of space, scale, the focal area allows you to plan your strategies properly. So as I said, now from tiger reserves to tiger conservation landscape is being talked about. Because there are many tiger reserves. If you can take an example here, there's an Anamalai tiger reserve, Samudamalai tiger reserve, Vainar tiger reserve, Vainar is there, and Badipur tiger reserve, Periyar tiger reserve, Parambiklam. So the, these are many tiger reserves. But there are areas like Vainar, I mean, the tigers are there, but they may not have that kind of full fledged tiger reserve. But the composition matters. So you cannot just only focus on the tiger reserves, it needs to be looked at the tiger conservation landscape. So that's why even though the Tiger Reserve talks about Tiger Conservation Plan, but there's still scope to enhance or increase into a landscape. So because Tigers move beyond PA-centric approach, because things like a boundary definition is very difficult. So it's in a way, it mimics the man and biosphere model in a spatial arrangement because they already have, even the Tiger Reserve, they have a core, they have a buffer, no? So many of those things they have. So that is how we need to really see how this integration can take place. Because see, when you talk about geography, geography is essentially the foundation for most of the understanding. Because geography comes through a long-term evolutionary process. It's very difficult to change in short term. So if anything has to be decided, I think geography provides a foundation for laying many layers. It's an ecological layer, it's a social layer, it's you know, a development layer. If you overlay them, then you have a better understanding of what can happen. Because I think geography, but the one, one limitation with the geography is that it can only predict at slightly large scale uh, on its own. But if you combine it with the ecology and behavior, sociology, then you are in, in a position to predict the pattern processes, slightly finer scale, which is more important for actions. Because sensitivity of change at large scale is very difficult to kind of address back. That is why even in the climate change, which is a large scale phenomena, people are talking about address now because by the time you see a visible effect, it will be kind of a situation of you can't do, helpless situation will become. 
Similarly, if you understand the geography through this ecological lenses, environment lenses, behavior lenses, I think you are in a better position to equip yourself, understand more of geography. So in the past, we did have issues, as I said, about scientific development and the conservation requirement having a mismatch. Because of that, the institutional and technical inadequacies existed in managing these buffer zones. So it remained a protective, protective area centric approach, even though the components had much more large landscape approach. So sometimes there's always been ambiguity in the application of inclusive agenda and core because core, what we have decided, it is a more of a administrative or political boundary, but it may not always necessarily an ecological boundary. Therefore, it's very hard to kind of apply the exclusive approach into this um, different land elements. The other component, I mean, the program that came uh, into action was Biodiversity Conservation Rural Livelihood Improvement Project, which was funded by Wild Bank. So through MOEF, so it had a five-year project which I had, you know, two pilot areas. But unfortunately, it didn't take shape. Um, I mean, due to whatever reasons. But now people are realizing it. Many institutions, UNDP, UNFAO, JEF, many of them are actually now talking about um, having landscape level programs. So this landscape program allows us uh, to look at conservation planning. How do we go about conservation planning? Okay, so let's say this is an example of India. So once you really want to guide conservation, so we need to have the geographical understanding, we need to understand ecological understanding, we need to combine them together. So this is uh, one approach where Wild Elephants of India way back in 1986. Um, so they started this work on trying to classify India into different biogeral zones. So this map is very standard map done through a lot of experts' knowledge, based on which we have now 10 biogeographic zones. So you must have seen this map, but please remember this is one of the guiding map for many of our activities in the country, whether the product area, whether some other representation need to be done. So the among the 10 biogeographic zones, so the trans Himalaya is mostly into the cold desert. Then we have the Himalayas, then desert system, semi-arid system. Western Guards, where you are located in a way. Deccan Plateau is the largest one, um, largest barrier zone in India. Gangetic Plain, coast, northeast, and islands. So this is how the subvisor classification has been done. So it's an hierarchical process. So we have the zone, then there are provinces. Under each of the zone, they've been subdivided into provinces. Because suppose as an example, Let's say I will take uh, say Western Guards, right? So Western Guards has two components. One is Malabar Plains. Again, I think mostly in Kerala. We don't have Kerala and probably Maharashtra part because we go to Sindhudur areas and all. You will have this Malabar Plains and Western Guards mountains. So these two constitute the Western Guards Bajar zone. So similarly, if you go to Deccan Plateau, Deccan Plateau has got Deccan Peninsula. It is called Central Highlands, Chotanagpur area, Eastern Highlands, Central Plateau, Deccan South. So these things have been decided. So this is at the slightly uh, larger scale, but below the zonal level. But even further, which is being described but not been mapped, is a landscape subregion. This I have taken as one example from, let's say, Central India, Central Islands, 6A. Each have been code unique. So zone one, two, three, up to 10. So then you have provinces as A, B, C. It goes like that. Then we have now looked at different landscapes. So within the Central Indian Islands, there are planned regions, okay? Vindhyan Plains, Eastern Malwa, you know, Nimar Plateau, Satpura Hills, Maika Hills, Rivapana. These are some of the things that we are trying to work on. Suppose beyond this, we can go into biomes. So you have these four categories, zone, province, land region, and uh, the biomes. But if you have this kind of arrangement, because this biosphere zone is essentially a process through a geography and fauna flora. So once you have this uniqueness, then we can ensure conservation through representation. So instead of distributing a protected network or doing actions 
in some restricted area we can distribute ensure conservation so in terms of operation planning when you deciding conservation areas so there are multiple ways to do one is single species focus like i said it could be tiger specific it could be elephant specific it could be nilgiri tiger specific it could be lion tail macaque specific grizzly giant squirrel specific it could be anything on the species focus the second could be patch matrix corridor model of landscapes so large areas so when you're designing you can always decide okay i want to ensure tiger conservation i want to ensure nilgiri tiger conservation then i decide my focal area around the species but here i want to decide on the whole landscape looking at patch matrix corridor because where energy is flow is maintained then you look at the reserve design model so i need to have size shape spacing so largely from the island biogeography island biogeography theory maybe if anybody is interested just read up it essentially talks about the size of a land and the biodiversity that it can accommodate okay so it is not that a land mass can accommodate you no know, n number of or innumerable species there are limit to each of the system depending on its size and its location and its death rate or birth rate or speciation or extinction that's what they say so if you really wanted to maintain optimum number of species you need to have the idea of a size shape and space that's what it says reserve design logic so using this we can look at the spatial prioritization this is one example from central india where we can decide okay this is my current protected network but i wanted to increase conservation focus into 30% 40% whatever how do i go about it so i now have these areas as my biodiversity areas let's say now there is a program called maxon this is this is spatial prioritization software um, you can use and then say okay these are my areas where the forest is good but to conserve this forest i have these costs to pay so the cost could be human disturbance cost cost could be some management action that might be required so given this available land area with biodiversity value and the cost then you can select okay these are the areas i select where i have low cost to pay for conservation sometimes it's necessary that you might have to pay high cost so based on which you identify okay these are the selected areas for conservation so it can do on multiple scale these two map that you see in green they have different scales if you have large scale um, i mean in terms of the grain um, if you just uh, you know take like 25 km then you don't have a contiguous areas of 25 so this also takes into contiguity contiguous areas of smaller scale higher scale then you decide okay this is what i want if i am interested in for tiger this grain area on the left side is only useful but if i'm interested in more than tiger then i can go into this other one so that is how you select it but after selection you can also decide which one i need to focus more which area is more priority areas there is something known as a selection frequency you do a iteration based on the iteration which pixel or which areas comes more often then you select we say okay the area which is showing as 90 to 100 or 80 to 90 is area i need to prioritize more because it has got uh, contiguous habitat it has low cost so this spatial pattern is all possible in the science of landscape ecology there are other approaches like the spatially meta population model people call it so it essentially talks about how you look at the source area searching areas so here it is so when you look at a, a large area then there are areas called source there are areas called sink source area is the definition of source area is the area where birth is more than death say natality which is a birth is more than the death that is a core area in in the sink area where birth is less than the death so suppose in an area where birth is more then the population is going to grow because it can compensate for the death because more than the birth so the population will grow but in the sink where birth is less than the death then the population slowly 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 will get eliminated but in this meta population model there are areas from the where the population is increasing more it can go and occupy the sink areas so the whole system is kept intact sometimes there could be multiple core fragmented but they need to be supported by each other that can also happen 
So this is a one way where you look at a conservation planning. Other one is, I mean, there are many, many, many examples for landscape ecology, how it is involved. The species distribution modeling. This is an example from US where you can look at species habit relationship and can come up with the distribution mapping for large area based on which you can look at conservation focus. So the blue area is a lowest you know, probability of a species to occur. And the red area has got a very high probability of a species to occur. So the species distribution modeling allows us to understand these relationships. Yeah. So that way you get guided by science. And when you're planning, it's spatially explicit. When I say spatially explicit, it is in the form of of a map and referenced, geo-referenced, geo so that anybody looks at any detail, they know where exactly is what located, which is important than just doing a spatial modeling. That is why landscape ecology is an important science, and it, it can be used as a multidisciplinary approach to science, management, even economic development. So in terms of decision-making, I think landscape ecology can allow us, because in the process of decision making, these steps that is being written is important. One is looking at the alternatives, looking at the uncertainties, risk, you know, the personal issues, feasibility, for example, and then complexities. So all those things are there. So in fact, one of the examples that we looked at, so this is how this decision making process can happen in terms of methodology framework. So when you have certain objective, you need to start with desk review, literature review, then start collecting spatial data, then do a preliminary survey. Based on this information, you can identify the zone of influence, which is a focal area that you really wanted to do. Then you undertake biodiversity. This example, you can look at like biodiversity mapping and looking at the impact assessment. Then once you do the field survey, then you can come up with the biodiversity scorecard, then do a spatial analysis, then you look at cumulative impact. So what kind of effects can happen over a period of time. Then you look at the visualization of the output, characterize them in terms of green zone, red zone, depending on what your objective. So this example is about Bhagiradi uh, Valley, Alagnanda Bhagiradi Valley in Uttarakhand, where the dots are the proposed red dams. So now these are being proposed. These are the biodiversity areas. Now you need to make a decision. So how to go about this? So first, you characterize the biodiversity. So in the entire basin, we take a sub-basin. You can have sub-basin values based on the field survey or a desk survey or combination. If you have luxury of time and resources, you must do combination of desk survey and field survey using the biodiversity value, you would say high, low, medium biodiversity. And you can also add other critical elements. Okay, you see this map, okay, test biodiversity. And you can look at critical habitat, biodiversity areas, national parks. You keep adding more value to this whole area. Then you look at the impact. So which area has got more impact depending on the project size, number, and everything. So you have one side, the biodiversity significance. The other side, you have significance of impact. Overlapping these two, you can look at which area has got more impact. For example, if you look at this one, you see this, the the red with uh, so much of uh, uh, so green with so much of red means it's an area with high biodiversity value. But here, even if you have a moderate biodiversity value, but then impact significance is quite high. Therefore, you cannot do this. Similarly, this area, this red area is more impact, but then they may not have a high biodiversity value. So. Maybe because of that, you're not able to um, kind of define it as an impact zone. So you can kind of start looking at uh, these kind of strategies in landscape science. So essentially to me, the whole process of landscape, understanding spatial pattern, you know, and uh, the, the process of learning through this science allows us to do a proper decision making. So then it becomes a proper scientific support system. So what we call them decision support system. Otherwise, as a geographer, we try to collect information, you provide information, but the end user is not going to look at a single source. So they really wanted to have a multiple source information. And then you start looking at, okay, this is what we want, this is what we want. 
and, and spatially is uh, arranged or referenced so the decision making become easier so this is uh, one of the example and there are many such examples that we want to look at it so in my presentation i was just trying to kind of give you an overview of what this core science behind the landscape ecology how the current conservation model exists and what are the ways in which it can be applied and there's so much of scope that one can explore and tools and techniques have developed there are customized softwares available these days people are using r codes you can have codes develop and then run analysis and also we have a lot of free data up to even the 10 meter resolution is available so the whole the geography and landscape ecology is become much more kind of easier these days or less expensive because of the open source or free database that is available to all of us so therefore i like to kind of conclude by I mean, it's almost an hour time now, so we can have a lot of discussion after this to kind of give you an overview or take home, so you understand the landscape ecology is a science of space and scale. Because of this composition, you are able to understand the phenomena much better than conventional geography or conventional ecology. So, by integrating these two, you are in a position to understand the pattern much better, you are in a better position to predict the occurrences. Therefore, you are in a position to guide uh, management actions through strong science. Yeah. So this is how the whole thing happens. So thank you so much. So I think it's one hour time, there's a lot of time to leave a talk. Um, so I've been able to do this. So we will be able to take questions, interact with all of you. So that's all I have. Thank you so much once again. Thank you, sir. Uh, fantastic uh, presentation and uh, your uh, simplistic explanation was uh, the, the best uh, that uh, I, I think most of them would have liked that. The way uh, you put through the, um, uh, the uh, landscape related concept and uh, the explanations that you provided. Now, uh, I'll uh, request all the participants uh, who are, are interested to ask questions to unmute themselves and uh, go ahead and ask your question. Right? I see some people from Kumbhakonam. So just for information, yeah. I'm from I'm closer to Kumbhakonam. <laughs> so there are the, the participants include um, uh, from across India, from uh, JNK yeah. to Kanyakumari, and from North uh, Arunachal Pradesh to Gujarat, and yeah, yeah. some even are from uh, abroad as well. So, uh, so sometimes they used to join. So today I think no one has joined from abroad. So. Sir, uh, let me let me start with uh, uh, one of the uh, questions. Now, uh, uh, in geography, we normally take uh, uh, a geohydrological unit or uh, watershed as uh, uh, a landscape unit uh, you know, to work with uh, uh, most of the geographical phenomena uh, uh, that are associated, uh, you know, just a beat landslides or uh, you know, running water related issues or something like that. Now, when it comes to wildlife, uh, that uh, unit changes. Because uh, be it tiger, be it elephant, they have uh, at their own range. It will be going beyond a single watershed. So how do we uh, incorporate that? So we take a, a landscape separately for elephant and uh, work or uh, tiger for that matter. So I think it's, uh, I mean, you asked the very right question in the sense that, you know, the watershed to me is now coming back as one of the major focal area for even wildlife conservation. So we need to have a, bottom up you know top down approach to integrate this so it's essentially the multiple scale approach so watershed is the one which has a strong ecological boundary okay even for a tiger which may be moving beyond but the core support system which is the prey base is strongly dependent on the watershed supported the vegetation so one strong element is definitely there so if you really want to look at a tiger population, maybe you can increase, see, watershed is all everything because clearly defined boundary through natural features, but you can expand the boundary to a next watershed if you really want to. But this is a multi-layered approach. I, I am now in started looking back to the landscape into a watershed based. In fact, we are looking at 
the whole conservation need to rearrange itself into this whole watershed. Therefore, the relationship between the forest, water, agriculture, nexus is well understood. So whoever wants to develop a policy or even the people, they understand. But otherwise, so far, fortunately or unfortunately, the past development of so whatever the disciplines, they become compartmentalized. Because compartmentalized, we have become an expert, but become a you know, professionals with no solution. So that's a practical side of the current uh, situation. That is why the landscape ecology tries to bring together this multidisciplinary understanding. Therefore, making, for example, why I was more interested in talking to you as a geographer, because it's very important. Otherwise, we talk to wildlife biologists themselves, and then geographers, you talk to them. But if you join together, we can find a solution. So for your question of tiger, it's really you can scale up, take the micro watershed and take this watershed and maybe go to the larger region. So then you can integrate them. Okay. And there are questions coming so then, up in the uh, chat box. Maybe uh, yeah. uh, we can also pick it up later. So, uh, so should I uh, read that for you, or uh, can you go through that and? Uh, I can, I can, I can do, go through. No problem. That's not an issue. Right, huh? So I think that I just go from, um, I think uh, from the earliest to now. Yes. Okay. So I think I have uh, mostly it's uh, uh, just talking about comment on the presentation, but I think there's a question. But the first question is about somebody wanted to say, do you think in terms of scale and space where geography and ecology are integrated, it should be incorporated into schools? Absolutely. I think this is what I wanted to invite. One of the reasons why I was more than keen to participate in the webinar is that we've been talking to senior level people and others, but ultimately, if it doesn't get integrated into a school syllabus or into the local level, say, for example, I was trying to explain small, maybe we can create a small case studies examples then stu people, students will understand. So if, as geography student, ecology student, doesn't matter because ultimately the ecology is guided by the geography. Okay, the geographical features over temporal scale will change depending on what kind of environment and things like that. So adaptive factor will change. So therefore it needed to be in, uh, incorporated there. I, that's what I think uh, that's, that's a very important point I would say coming from, I think uh, Mr. Jivananda. So I think the next question is about, uh, somebody said it's expensive lecture. I don't know what it means. <laughs> so, so, okay, so. <laughs> yeah, maybe impressive he might have written. It might have become okay. something like that. <laughs> so I thought, I was wondering whether you were just asking them to pay so much money, sir. So. <laughs> I know it's not. It's uh, completely free of cost. Only, uh, I, know. only I am the one who is spending uh, money. I know, I, know. Just, I know, just kidding. Okay. So the other question is, what will be the perfect parameter to create a buffer of selecting samples of hydrology in Babatarai landscape? Okay. That, I mean, I'm very familiar with this uh, Babatarai yes. landscape yeah. because I've studied uh, there. So the buffer, again, depends on the phenomena. For example, if Babatarai landscape if you really want to create a buffer, what exactly we want to focus, whether it's going to be the whole system we are interested in or per tiger. So for that, what we need to see is um, the zone of influence. So you can look at, you, you have this whole buffer that I land future, you place them, then you see, then overlay that with the human action or development aspiration. Then see some area, there will be high concentration of people, some are low concentration of people. So the zone of influence will be varying. So depending on the zone of influence, the buffer can be drawn. So we have seen in some places, let's say as an example from the wildlife perspective, during the Tarai survey, uh, we could notice the human disturbance can penetrate up to two kilometers. Okay, so that may not be the same scale everywhere. So some area where the human concentration is more, it could be two, sometimes it could be one kilometer based on that. It's much, much, it's much easier to do. It can be easily done that. So that is how this buffer can be uh, defined. So that was a question from Sri Devi. And the other question is, can you explain prey and relationship at scale in Indian context? I think I was explaining in Indian context. Let's say there is an area, let's say, let's take uh, Parambikulam Tiger Reserve or Mudumalai Tiger Reserve. There's a tiger, there's a Cheetal. So if you take Tiger Reserve as one large unit, if you monitor the tiger population over say 10 years, you see the tiger number is more with the prey number. So that is a prey predate relationship. It's a temporal scale. There will be a positive relationship. But if you, even if you go to Mudumalai or any of the tiger reserve, so you divide the tiger reserve into say one kilometer grid. 
you divide them in one kilometer grid, you go to each of the grid, you survey, you will find predator. They may not be the same place, they are somewhere within the one kilometer, there will be high number of prey, there will be high number of predator movement. So then when you are doing a correlation analysis, you will see a positive relationship. But if you divide this same area into 100 meter distance, much, much smaller grid, you go to one grid, you will find tiger, other smaller grid, you'll find prey. Very rarely you will find within a hectare or within a small area, both hanging together. They tend to avoid locally. Prey will avoid the predator locally. Therefore, you will see a lot of zeros of tiger in where prey is there, vice versa. In that case, we will use this data and build a correlation analysis. You will find a negative relationship. That is what it is. Yeah. Sir, so, uh, what about uh, uh, fragmented landscapes? For example, those in Orissa, um, uh, Chhattisgarh, those areas and all, most of the uh, forest landscapes have got fragmented. You have uh, villages encroaching into it or, uh, you know, uh, the mining companies that they have occupied a lot of areas. So what what kind of an approach should, be, uh, should we be taking there? Mm -hmm. Exactly. They, this is more applicable to fragmented landscape. Mm -hmm. Because contiguous landscape is much less because the interdisciplinary requirement is not there in a contiguous landscape. Okay, maybe it's only for ecological understanding, maybe academic purpose or academic phenomena or even maybe the climate change impact, we can do the contiguous landscape. Whereas these kind of fragment landscape where the interface or interactive elements are higher, the landscape ecology is the most important uh, line that we need to take. So when you look at Orissa, all these areas, you put a forest, then human habitation, then you start understanding the spatial pattern of the fragmentation. Okay. So it is fragmented, but then who is the neighbor to the fragments? That will decide the future of the fragment. If it is a low density population, maybe even if it is a smaller fragment, it will live through. But if it is high density, but your fragment size is higher, but future it might not be there. So when you have this understanding, then you can decide, okay, this is where I want to put a boundary. This is where I want to put a buffer. And then social, even behavioral science. See, when I said this geography and uh, ecology, but you can also do a third dimension to behavior, the social economics. You know? yes. What people, a spatial pattern of the socioeconomic will also decide what kind of uh, quality of life people are going to have. So I think we can apply this into a multidisciplinary element. Okay, so. I think those these are the kind of approaches that you can actually have it in a um, the landscape context. See, that's what landscape ecology as a science allows the flexibility at the same time the guiding principle. It's up to us how you want to apply. So I think with this geographer, ecologist, sociologist, economics, put together doing a project or somebody like mentioned bringing it in the Curriculum will be an excellent thing to do. Yeah. So some of those things are uh, very, very important to do. There's one more question that could you connect niche habitat ecosystem biome and biosphere reserve with the landscape? Yes, I can. I think I can even take a separate lecture on it. But let me just explain that uh, simply. See, as, as you see, landscape ecology is simply looking at the spatial pattern of whatever. So let's say biosphere reserve in landscape ecology concept is provide you the external boundary, extent. So just understand one biosphere reserve is a boundary under the landscape ecology framework. Now, biome goes much, much higher. Sometimes depend, sometime people define the biome into a large scale. Sometimes the biome is also decided a small scale. There are, there are definitions that I said, biological classification. Biome is mostly about the ecosystem types, forest types. So they call it as a biome. But some people define a eco region also in the biome is large. So I think that definition you can read through the apply. An ecosystem again, ecosystem is see for your ecosystem even it's a wetland ecosystem. It is a wetland. It's a matrix there. So from landscape ecology, it's a matrix. Wetland may water is a matrix. That's a large influencing element. So everything else revolves around it. Habitat is always species specific. When you say habitat. There is no standalone. It is something to do with the some species. It could be to do the tree species. It could be the animal species. That's what it defined. Niche is an area where the resources are there. So niche, again, related to species or to communities. It can go beyond one species. 
So I think that is how I can link. So maybe each of those words you can look through. I don't think I need to explain that. Even if you go to a, so I mean Google, you will find all those uh, meanings. I think there is one more question that has come up. Yeah, there's one more. Corridors for large mammals are often disturbed by developing activities by us human beings. Of course. How can you use landscape to provide smooth interaction to different population? So um, particularly for this, um, I will take this connecting uh, statement. So development activities and uh, corridor. So what landscape ecology can allow us is to looking at the pattern, the flow. Ultimately, when we say corridor, corridor is a flow of gene, flow of energy from one place to other. In a contiguous landscape, animals are not, again, randomly moving, given a contiguous landscape. Within the contiguous landscape, depending on the resources in the forest, animal will be, animal will be moving. Okay. So, by understanding this, we should be in a position to identify where we can have the corridor. Suppose even if this is a fragmentation or development activities disturbs it, we will be in a position to identify if you put a corridor here, it is more expensive, efficient than somewhere else. So that is how the smooth, you know, interaction or facilitating population from one to other can actually happen. So this um, uh, new uh, initiatives that have come up, uh, for example, Rural Development Dep uh, Department uh, has initiated this uh, urban planning uh, process. That is uh, uh, bringing urban amenities into the rural most parts of India, right, or rural most villages. So some of these villages uh, are uh, located right uh, uh, either inside a complete uh, forested area, right, or uh, very close to uh, uh, such locations. So uh, what is the situation there? So um, uh, when we look at this uh, landscape level planning that has been that is being adopted and uh, the development that is being put into or thrust upon these areas. So how do uh, we uh, uh, work on those kind of situations? So that's right. No, because most of the time what happens is we have this uh, development projects and actions coming, then only we uh, kind of respond to it. So this is where we are facing a problem. So if you have a landscape concept, when you start visualizing things based on the past and the extent, and maybe with some modeling approach, we can do it. A lot of people have worked on land dynamic model and futuristic model. Then you can identify an area where we cannot actually compromise. So that becomes a no-go area. And there are areas where, for example, I showed you an example of spatial planning. So based on the selection frequency, we say, oh, these areas are absolutely critical. You cannot compromise. But there are whereas other areas which has wildlife, but still development interest is there. But you can have a negotiation. Same goes for this uh, hydropower project where we could actually identify so no the areas that cannot be compromised. So I think that is how it can happen. I think that's a related thing. There's one other question that has come up uh, from uh, Ms. Malini. Uh, no, I think it's it's about uh, the approach, regional plan. I think in India it is also there, and there are some working example. I think I don't have to go far away. It's very close to Palkar. Attapadi Hill Area Development Project is one of the classic example for landscape and uh, multidisciplinary approach. In fact, they could actually revive it under the Jaika project um, some years ago. But unfortunately, because it was treated as a project, it didn't get institutionalized. It. So it's kind of maybe got affected or it was not providing desired result. But then while it was implemented, it is there. Similarly, we have a regional conservation planning for gear landscape. But these are very sporad sporadic examples uh, you know, driven by individuals on the ground. But institutionally, for the first time, although landscape has been talked about for a long time, because the way it is was promoted or because of who it promoted, it remained uh, very restrictive. But now with the National Wildlife Action Plan talking about landscape approach, now, in fact, many of this international uh, government, in fact, the U.S. has also come up with... Uh, the national framework for landscape approach. I think it's going to gain more ground. So physical, say like I showed an example, uh, I think even in Kerala, people did a landscape perspective plan in the past, but again, it's, it remained an academic exercise. But with this whole visor classification and the landscape, we can have a physical boundary in the planning processes. But one catch to this whole approach is that how do we implement it? Do we look at a new model or if we want to integrate it into the existing model? 
if you ask this question everybody will say nobody likes a new model but needs to be integrated so in that perspective i think the whole landscape approach once you understand from a science but when it comes to implementation we can take this district planning route so it can get integrated into district management plan and it can get integrated into panchayat development plan so if you do this i think this science will get integrated into an action otherwise it will remain like a one exclusive approach people see it from a distance that is what i feel it, it is possible for us to do so in fact your question about infrastructure again i would say uh, most of the time we evaluate infrastructure based on what it is but to us we need to actually have a future infrastructure plan only then the planning process will become easier otherwise it will actually be a deadlock or sometime it's like compromise i think people yeah, should also sorry yeah, planning planning has to change from stop gap arrangements to uh, futuristic uh, yeah. as such right so uh, as of now we have the stop gap uh, planning process no uh, we have a traffic jam we plan for that particular traffic jam only right? yeah it, it, yeah it's it's more like a crisis management than actually plan so although we yeah. say it is a plan it's a more of a crisis management but then if we Something, really say a plan uh, it needs to look at the futuristic development accommodate that but it's also should facilitate the development it should not be just you know say oh, you don't do this so i don't agree to this concept that you no know, when you look at a development i always try to say no but uh, through this landscape approach we can actually facilitate uh, where development can take place without compromising on this uh, you no know, or the conservation value or ecological integrity right mm. i think this Even, is uh, how change of scale can influence statistical change i actually explained that right, uh, i actually explained that in terms of the positive and negative relationship based on the size of the scale of your measurement Uh, when we look at uh, conflict landscapes uh, uh, just like uh, wild wild wildlife wild animal and uh, uh, human landscape conflict areas uh, uh, that, that's also on the increasing side mm -hmm. yes it is it is that is why even for the conflict also i feel the same uh, question so to we need to have a futuristic uh, modeling where the conflict is likely to take place most of the time what we do is we do a modeling based on where the conflict is taking place but that only provides part of the information but what we need is what, what we need is based on the movement pattern or developmental aspiration or population growth of people we need to look at where the future conflict can take place there is one more question sir that um, could you explain between ecology and ecosystem ecosystem is actually different defined uh, system right ecology is 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 understanding about them so i think uh, it's 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 about study and it's about the physical space okay sir one, one um, uh, interest a question for uh, those who are uh, students here um, on behalf of them i will be asking that so uh, what is the career possibilities especially in higher uh, higher studies etc does uh, wii uh, provide uh, some uh, training on uh, or uh, courses on landscape management uh, related so no. issues but no but then we we are in the process in fact uh, i'll tell you uh, we have in uh, an indian uh, chapter uh, for landscape ecology there's yeah, an international yes, association which has been running since 1980 as a part of that one we have an indian chapter which is uh, formed in 2018 but now we are going to be having our first symposium in october uh, okay. on a hybrid mode virtual as well as uh, uh, in person so in fact depending on the covid situation the percentage of virtual will be there so you can check up to this i mean i can just uh, type it in the chat box the website uh, uh, you can go into this and register for the conference so this is one way and we also have a newsletter coming about the landscape ecology second is uh, we are also thinking of starting a landscape ecology course so this is one opportunity and next year in coimbatore uh, there is going to be a big meeting on the conservation asia where there will be a dedicated session on the landscape ecology and there could also be landscape ecology course uh, in addition to that we are in the process of promoting landscape ecology as a subject in uh, most of the universities and colleges if possible so where possible we have a small uh, um, syllabus change or have a subject or in some situation we can even have a landscape ecology a full fledged course so this is uh, the process in terms of career opportunity i would say um, i think in, in when you compare with the exclusive uh, specialization in, in geography or ecology and things like that 
because landscape ecology um, entails a theoretical understanding skill sets of remote sensing GIS and modeling, mm -hmm. I think the employability with this learning is much higher because you can get employed anywhere. It could be an NGO, it could be a government, it could be even if you have an individual startup. I think that is where, or you can become a consultant. So this whole uh, options gets opened up when we have this great understanding. Uh, sir, as of now, those who are interested in um, doing research uh, uh, leading to PhD, uh, they can uh, register with WII, right, sir? Yeah, they, they can approach through uh, my now, the, the approach the individual faculty approach me, and then we can facilitate. And in fact, we've been working internationally also. There are options to go abroad, do a PhD um, exclusively there, or through collaboration. Germany, uh, Canada. We have a good uh, working relationship with the uh, University of British Columbia. There's a university in Germany and uh, Switzerland. I mean, there are many options. I think students need to open up and uh, they should be uh, included. I think there's another suggestion as urban planning architecture. I think city planning. I think I would say landscape uh, concept has to get integrated in all planning process. I would even go to the village development plan. In fact, I've been working on two things. I'm, I probably don't want to disclose so much of it that. There's a landscape management plan being developed in Madhya Pradesh, in this uh, map that I showed. So we are almost through with the draft where we are trying to focus on the whole landscape and also district management plan. The other project that we are in the pipeline is to develop a Kaveri restoration. So instead of getting into all those conflict where we want to focus more through the people and uh, um, the restoration process. So I have a district management plan, there's a village development plan where we can incorporate this one. So once you have this plan, uh, urban planning or even city planning, I would say. I think there's a big scope. Ma Malini ji is an urban planner. Uh, she, uh, she is with uh, uh, IIT Mumbai. No, I think it's a, I, I can clearly see that, you know, that right. this is where I would like to you know join hands and then trying to promote yes. or develop a small scale model. Because right. we are mostly working from the natural areas. Because to me, uh, urban uh, biodiversity, rural biodiversity, these are all very important. But then most of the time when we talk about biodiversity, it doesn't take the attention of the people because it is seen like we are promoting some agenda. But then when you look at the planning process for development, where you incorporate this one, I think it becomes easier. So district planning process, uh, panchayat in the rural setting, in urban setting, if you have a city plan, uh, so I think that is where we can have. There are some model is there um, in terms of looking at the surrogate options. So because you cannot quantify the biodiversity the entirely, even with the multiple experts, it's, it's a, but then we should look at some surrogate approach where you can at least say, okay, this is an area, this high biodiversity, this is a low biodiversity or restoration. So there's also a, a one uh, department in the University of British Columbia, we can actually um, look at uh, option where they call it as a collaborative learning and advanced planning. Collaborative learning, advanced planning. This is exactly how you do an urban planning. You know? So yeah. I think we can do. So you can incorporate this in the definitely urban planning architecture courses. So me personally will be more interested to promote this. I mean, not as a kind of a agenda here uh, to actually get this uh, discipline integrated into many of the courses. I mean, we could actually come uh, directly or virtually to um, give lecture or offer some of these modules. Any more questions? Yes. So shall we conclude, sir? Yeah, yeah, it's up to you. <laughs> I think two hour session is usually is very long. <laughs> so it's, uh, I think it's right. the right yeah, time. Right. Right. So, uh, um, uh, it was uh, really interesting, sir. Thank you uh, very much for uh, uh, you know today's uh, because you are in a very busy schedule also uh, with regard to your research work that is going on on uh, Western Ghats related uh, area, right, sir? Yeah. Uh, uh, so how is it progressing, sir? Uh, no. uh, you are able to do field work or uh, mm -hmm. no? Currently, we are in the basically uh, discussion stage. I I have come for uh, in addition to project there are other uh, purpose. In fact. I also came to discuss with the Kumaraguru Institute where uh, the, they will be the host for the next uh, year, okay. the, the world, the annual Asia conference. So okay, okay, okay. that's a planning also. So it's, right. it's, it's going good. Right. So let me uh, request one of my students, uh, uh, Suparna, if you can give the vote of thanks. Hmm. Okay, sir. Good evening to all.
we have been listening to a very enlightening talk on the science of scale and space integrating geography and ecology by dr ramesh krishnamurthy it is an honor and privilege to offer him word of thanks sir your presentation has given us insight into the broader aspect of this topic and about the landscape ecology and its basic elements challenges and its conservation etc the photographs and the maps enhanced the presentation and made it easy to convey the idea totally it gave detailed and informative knowledge about the landscape ecology and is very useful to us in our future studies too thank you for explaining to us in detail about this wonderful topic sir let me take this opportunity to thank you on behalf of the department of geography for sparing your time from a very busy schedule and introducing us this topic thank you sir let me also extend my sincere thanks to all the faculty members of the department of geography and all the students of the department for having actively participating in the session thank you all i extend my sincere thanks to research scholars project staff of the department and faculty members and the students of other colleges institution for their participation thank you once again to one and all with this the webinar comes to a close all can now exit the session thank you thank you so much all the best everyone you. so you thank can you, you're thank welcome you. to reach out yeah anytime right thank, thank, thank you. you for your contribution today sir it will do it will it was of uh, immense help right uh, and uh, hopefully uh, we'll uh, uh, keep going like this and uh, maybe promote little more interdisciplinary research because that that is where the scope uh, uh, of you uh, know maybe uh, for all these subjects which are you know, geography uh, and other related subjects which address um, landscape related issues lies uh, as such right so that is what no, i believe I and that is why uh, right uh, Right, sir. Definitely, I think um, I already shared uh, my email ID. If anybody is willing to or uh, interested, then uh, they can actually always reach out. We can uh, definitely see future support. Right, sir. Thank you so much. Bye bye. All the best. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Bye bye, sir. Thank you. Right.